All right, if you'll take your Bibles now, open them to, I'm going to ask you to do this, open to John chapter 1. You can open to Matthew chapter 8 as well. I'm only going to quote one verse from that. If you want to look at both, you're welcome to it. But I want to read Matthew chapter 8, verse 1. I'm beginning a new series of messages now this morning called Why Follow Jesus. And uh, I am going to use this one verse, Matthew chapter 8, verse 1, as the theme of my uh, study or these series, this, these sermons. And uh, Matthew 8, 1 is right after Jesus had preached on the Sermon on the Mount and it says that uh, when he was come down from that mountain, great multitudes followed him. Now, as I said this morning, I'm beginning a new five-week series on uh, why we should follow Jesus. And first and foremost, I believe we should follow him because of who he is. And who is he? Well, uh, let's look at John chapter 1. John chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. It says there, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and this life was, uh, it was the light of men. The light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Then I want you to see verse 14 says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is the only begotten of the says, follow, follow, I will follow Jesus. Anywhere, everywhere, I will follow on. Follow, follow, I will follow Jesus. Everywhere he leads me, I will follow on. But why? Why should we follow him uh, again? First and foremost, I suggest here now this morning that we should follow him because of who he is. And who is he? Well, let me share three answers to that question. First of all, I believe we should follow Jesus because he is God the Son. Now you say, well, I've heard many times that Jesus was the Son of God. Indeed. There are, I believe, as many as 69 references in the New Testament to Jesus being the Son of God. But I'm going to call him God the Son, which is not mentioned not one single time in the Bible. So why would I do that? Well, non-Trinitarians, those who do not believe in the Trinity, will use this excuse as saying that Jesus being the Son of God means that he is not deity, he is God's Son, but he is not equal to God. And also, um, let me tell you that in Genesis chapter 6, or, yeah, in Genesis chapter 6, it mentions about uh, angels being called the sons of God. The, the angels, the sons of God, had intermarried with the daughters of men and produced the Nephilim, the giants of the land, in those days. And, and so uh, sons of God can be a reference to angels. And on Wednesday nights recently, we have clearly established from the book of Hebrews that Jesus was not, is not an angel. He is the creator of angels. Now also, in John chapter 1, verse 12, it says in that verse that as many as a, of us who have received Christ as our Lord and Savior, he gave you power to become the sons of God. Now, so we can be called sons of God. Angels can be called sons of God. Jesus can be called the Son of God, and that is accurately so, for he is the Son of God. But let me tell you, we cannot diminish who he is by calling him the Son of God and saying that he is not equal to the Father, that he is not deity. To the contrary, he is equal to the Father and he is deity. There is one God. Deuteronomy 6.4 says, The Lord our God is one Lord, and he is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Someone say amen. amen. I, I now tell you that Jesus is God the Son, and as God the Son, he is one with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. Now, he claimed that publicly as well. Jesus did not deny that truth. In fact, 
In John chapter 10, verse 30, he had once said to those who were around him and were hearing him as he's preaching the word, he said, I and my father, we are one. That riled up the anger. Boy, did it rile up the anger of the religious establishment, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, all of those guys. Didn't like it one iota of a bit. They got very infuriated and angry at him saying, I and my father are one. But that didn't stop Jesus. He did not back down, not one bit at all. For in John 10, 38, he went on and said that I am in my father and my father, he is in me. Amen. Then there was another time. Let me share this one. Jesus, when he was in the garden of Gethsemane, when he was praying to his father, he was praying for the disciples. He was praying for all of his followers. He was praying, believe it or not, for you and I when he was in that garden of Gethsemane. For everyone who would receive his, him as Savior, we were on his mind. As he was in that shadow of the cross. And this is what he said. He said, Holy Father. He addressed his Father with respect and reverence as he was in that garden. In John 17, 11, he said, Holy Father, he said, keep them in thy name, that they may be one, all those who you have given to me, that they may be one as we are. Jesus recognized publicly and declared publicly that he was one with the Father and wanted us to be one with him so that as he is one with the Father. As God the Father, as God the Son, Jesus is one with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. And then I'll tell you that Jesus had a very close relationship with his Father. His Father also declared publicly that Jesus was his Son. For there are two places in the Bible we can see that directly God the Father had declared that Jesus was his Son so that people could hear it. The first one was at his baptism. John the Baptist preacher was in the Jordan River baptizing people, and then here comes Jesus, and John the Baptist looked out at him and said, he's the Lamb of God. He came down, and Jesus baptized, was, uh, John baptized Jesus. And this is what it says in Matthew three seventeen: When Jesus was baptized, he came up out of the water, and lo, the heavens were open, and he saw the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And then, lo, a voice from heaven, which is the Father, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So the Father said, This is my Son. Just like Jesus said, I and my Father, we are one. The Father is in me, and I in him. The Father said, it's my son. Then later on, at the transfiguration, when Jesus transfigured himself from his incarnated fleshly human body into his glorified state in the presence of Moses and Elijah before Peter, James, and John, the voice from heaven yet again, the Father said, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. That's in Matthew 17, verse 5. So there are two times there that we see the Father declared publicly Jesus was his Son. That's why we should follow him, because of who he is. He's God the Son. And he had that very unique and special relationship with his Father. For I will tell you that uh, Jesus, let me just give you an example. There's one time, there's a man who had been crippled for a long, long time. In John chapter 5 is where you read this. For over 30-something years, this man had been paralyzed, could not walk. And Jesus came and he said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And he healed that man who was crippled. And boy, the Pharisees didn't like that. You know why they didn't like it? Because he did that healing on the Sabbath day. Oh, those legalists, those who were so ritualistic in their 
their lives. They, they, they believe that you've got to do everything through legalism, that you got to... They believe that on the Sabbath day you did no work and to heal someone was work. And Jesus, how dare that this man heal someone on the Sabbath day? And Jesus gave glory to God as a result of what had happened to. In John 5, 18, he had glorified God. And it says in John 5, 18, therefore, the Jews were even more angry at him that only because he had broken the Sabbath in their eyes, but also because he said God was his father, making himself equal with God. They said, he said, God is his father, making himself equal with God. Guess what? God was his father, and he is one with God. That's why we should follow Jesus. Now, Jesus had a very close and loving relationship with his father as well. For, let me tell you this. Remember the time when Jesus was teaching the disciples how to pray? He said to them in Matthew 6, 9, After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He was telling his disciples, you give reverence to the Father. You give reverence to him. You hallow his name. He is holy. He is the holy God. And Jesus respected his Father. And then Jesus also obeyed his Father. For then we travel into yet once again and Jesus was in that garden and he said to the father father is there any other way and the father said no and he said nevertheless not my will but thine be done he obeyed his father and then he was fully dedicated to and committed to his father submitted himself fully and totally absolutely without a doubt unto his father for while he was on that cross he said this Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And then he died. Jesus had a very close, loving relationship with his father. And the father also had a loving, close relationship with the son. But the father saw you and I that we were fallen men. All because of our great, 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 put a whole bunch of more greats in front of it, Adam and Eve, our grandparents. First ones, you know. And that garden, when they sinned, that's the fall of man. And we're all doomed for hell. And God the Father saw that. The Son said, I'm, I will do it. The Son was willing to become the substitutionary sacrifice for us. So John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world, which is you and I, everyone who's ever lived is living now or ever will live on this earth. For God so loved the world, he gave his only only, only begotten Son, so that whosoever would believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The Father and the Son were always together, for they are one, and they loved each other. But there was a period of time when they were separated, and it was horrifying. It was the most horrific, frightening time in Jesus' life. It lasted for three hours. Jesus was on that cross. They nailed him to the cross at 9 o'clock in the morning, and from 9 until 12 noon, he was on that cross in excruciating torment and pain. At 12 o'clock noon, it got dark. Because Jesus was bearing the sins of the world. That's our sins. And since he was bearing our sins, sin and God did not coincide with one another. God is holy, and we are unholy. So because of our sins that were in the body and the life and the, of Jesus, the Father had, as I've always described it, the Father had to turn his head. The Father who was so holy could not behold his Son. So Jesus cried out, and he said, Father! My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Three hours. He was bearing the blunt of the punishment due to you and I. But out of grace and mercy, he took it in our place. 
For three hours, he was separated from his father. And then when he breathed his last, he went to be with his father and is at the right hand of his throne and will be forevermore. But what a horrifying time that must have been for the son. And then I will tell you we must follow him because not only is he one with the father, but he also is one with the Holy Spirit. They're all one together. As I said, Deuteronomy 6, 4 says, the Lord our God is one Lord, and, but he's one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Is that hard to comprehend? Well, let's go back to the baptism again. I, I go back again, again to Matthew 3, 16 and 17. Listen to these words. Jesus was being baptized. That's the Son in the Jordan River by John. Jesus is the Son. And when he came up out of the water, he looked up, the heavens were open, there is the Spirit, the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Spirit in the form of a dove coming and lighting upon him. And then the Father spoke from heaven, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You see it right there? You know the word Trinity is not in one place in the Bible. I challenge you to look it up, you will not find it. From Genesis to Revelation, you will not find the word Trinity. The word Trinity is a word that we put, that the, 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 the people who who uh, put the Bible, the canon of Scripture together as it's inspired by God and translated it and put it into the written page for you and I. They did not put the word Trinity in it because it's not in the original manuscripts because that is an English word that is used to describe God in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So even though the word Trinity is not in the Bible, we see the picture of it clearly. Amen? God in three persons. And Jesus not only was one with the Father, he was one with the Spirit. The Spirit came and lighted upon him. And um, this is what Jesus said to his disciples in John 14, 16. When he told them he was going to die, he said, I will pray the Father that he will send to you another comforter. And the word comforter is spelled with a capital letter C because it's in reference to the Holy Spirit. I will pray the Father that he will send you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Now you can say, all right, now, all right, I get it. The Holy Spirit abides with us, but is he in us? And how do we determine that Jesus is in us? You say we invite Jesus to live in us. When we get saved, he comes to live in us by way of the Holy Spirit. But where does it say that the Holy Spirit is in us? I mean, Jesus said he abides with us. That's John 14, 16. Just go to the next verse. John 14, 17. Where Jesus then said, He will abide with you and shall be in you. Jesus said it. The Holy Spirit is in us. And He is one with the Spirit. So the Spirit is in us. Then Jesus, by way of the Spirit, lives in, with, and through us. That is awesome. That is amazing. Think about it. That's why we ought not commit sin, because he sees and hears and knows everything we do. Because he's in us by way of the Spirit. We must not, must not grieve the Spirit. Then I'll tell you that as God the Son, not only is he one with God the, the Father and the Spirit, but also we should follow him because Jesus is the creator of all that there is. Look at verse 3, John 1, 3. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything that was made. You go out at night and count the stars. Count the stars. You know, as I've told you many times, I like to look at the comics. And there's Beetle Bailey. You know Beetle Bailey? About the army? You probably like that in Virgil. You were in the army. But anyway, Beetle Bailey. And uh, there's a, a private by the name of Zero. That boy is so dumb. I don't know if you ever read it, but he is dumb, dumb, dumb. And somebody had said to Beetle, or Beetle said to someone about the stars, it wouldn't be some if you could count the stars, and Zero decided he's going to do that. And it showed in the last frame of the comic strip, he's like 5,001, 5,002, 5,003, whatever. No one can count the stars. You can't do it. It's an unlimited number. It's, and you know, the planets, the galaxies, and everything. God made it. God, and, and, and just, that's way out there, way, 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 way out there. You know, I think about um, uh, back on December 21st, on the first day of winter, when we had the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn. 
And that was the closest they would gotten to each other. They were really so close that it made one bigger star. Remember that? So I was wondering, well, how close were they together? I looked it up this morning just out of curiosity. 456 million miles. And yet they're so close together, they made one big giant star. Just think if they got 100 miles apart. Think how big that would be up in the sky. And good gracious, if they got that close, it probably would have been a large, massive explosion. But the thing is, God holds it all together. God holds it all together. And God even created you and I and our, our complicated bodies that doctors have spent years studying and trying to figure out how to treat with diseases and everything. And, and boy, have they come a long way. But, you know, God created us. And just think of that brain that's in our head that makes some of us may have a smarter brain than others. I know I probably would be near the bottom, I guess, in all of us, but I don't claim to be intelligent. But I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this. God made that brain, and it's amazing what he has done for us to make us function in this life. And, and God is the creator. He is the instigator, and he is the one who's the sustainer. He holds it all together. In Colossians 1, 16 and 17, he said, For by God, for by God all things are created. They're in heaven, and they're in earth that are visible or invisible, whether it be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. He holds it all together. That's why we must follow Jesus, because he's God, the Son. Secondly, we should follow him because he is the Word. The Word you say, well, I have the Word right here in my hand. My, my copy of the Word, how can that be Jesus? Well, not in a literal way, but in a spiritual way, what we hold in our hand, it is Jesus. And, and let me explain that. He said it himself in John 1, 1 and 2. He said, it says, in the beginning was the Word. You notice that the word Word is capitalized because his comforter was capitalized in John 16, 14, the word word, or, word, or John 14, 16, the word word here is capitalized likewise because it's in reference to a person. In the beginning was the word, that's Jesus, the word was with God, and listen to this, the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And then go on down to verse 14 where it says, The Word, Jesus, became flesh, born in Bethlehem under the Virgin Mary. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, said John, as he wrote down those words. The glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus is the Word. And as the Word, He has revealed Himself in the Word and as the Word, just exactly who He is. We can find many references to in the Gospels as Jesus has revealed to us, to us clearly and distinctly and without a doubt who He is. But I, I'm going to share the seven I am statements in the book of John. The seven I am statements. You know... When God appeared unto Moses in that theophany of the burning bush, as the angel of the Lord, that was God the Son who appeared to Moses. Did you know that? That was Jesus as God the Son. He appeared to Moses in the burning bush. It was God the Son who did that. And he said to him, Moses said, well, what if the Israelites ask, who are you? And, and, and this is what God the Son said to him through that burning bush. He said, just say to them, Exodus 3.14, just say to them, I am who I am. I am. That's what he said. I am God. Now, Jesus, in the seven I am statements in the Gospel of John, revealed to us who he is. In John 6.35, he said, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. In John chapter 9, verse 5, he said, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. In John 10, 9, he said, I am the door. 
By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. In John 10, 11, oh, this gets exciting. He said, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep and for the world. In John chapter 11, 25 and 26, oh, one of my favorite passages, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? And then in John chapter 14, verse 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And in John 15, 9, he said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same beareth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. The seven I am statements. Jesus said, I am who I am. The people revered Abraham. He said to them in John chapter 8, verse 58, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham ever was, I am. He is the Word, and we should follow him because he is the Word. Come on, someone say amen. Help me out here. Please help me. We should follow him because of who he is. We should follow Jesus because he is God the Son. We should follow Jesus because he is the Word, Thirdly, and lastly, we should follow Jesus because he is the answer to all of life's problems. We are living in a life right now in this world that the problems are, in this world are filled, or the cup of problems are filled to the brim and they're spilling over. We have so many problems in this world. One problem we have in this world is the problem of hate and division. With all that's going on in our nation's capital, our country is split right down the middle. It is so, so sad. There's so much hate and division in our world. I thought when we go into 2021, maybe things would improve. It's no different. There's so many people that hate one another. You know what? Jesus is the answer to hate. In John, 1 John 4, 11, it says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, it says, If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. I didn't say that. The Bible says it. 1 John 4, 18, If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For how can he love not Man whom he can see, and then love God whom he cannot see, who is a spirit. How can he do that? He is also the answer in this world to sickness. We are in the midst, as we know, right in the very heart, it seems, of this pandemic with so many people getting sick. We have doctors and scientists throughout the world who are studying this. They've come up with this vaccine that hopefully will slow this thing down. But so many people have died from it. So many people have been or even still are and yet will be sick. But Jesus is the great physician. He's got it. We just got to trust him. As long as we're in his hands, we'll be all right. As I think about Miss Sue up there at Enman Hospital and I see you, I'm sure she has the best, most skilled doctors working with her right now. But she's got one good thing going for her today as she has the great physician overlooking her. Jesus is in control. It may not seem that way sometimes to us, but he is. As he told that... Uh, Man that was crippled in John 5, rise, John 5, 8, rise, take up your bed and walk. If we die in this life as a Christian, that's our ultimate healing. Amen. And that is Jesus saying, rise, take up your bed and walk. Double example, Viola Duncan recently, laying on a bed in a nursing home, had COVID, and she died. But I will tell you what, she didn't lose the battle, she won. 
because the great physician I know had come to her as she breathed her last and said, Miss Viola, rise, take up your bed and walk. And she's walking today in heaven. She has been healed. So Jesus not only is the solution and the answer to hate, but he is the solution and the answer to all sickness and disease in the world. And he's the answer and solution to fear. So many people are worried and afraid about this or that. And we say all the time, you know, I've said it. You've heard me say it. That I worry about my children one day when I'm long gone. And, and I, now, I, now I can say, as many of you have for a long time as grandparents to grandchildren, since I now have a grandchild, I, and I can say I worry about my granddaughter, our granddaughter, and how, what she's going to face one day in this life, in this world. We worry about things. But God says, fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. Isaiah 41.10 is where this is at. And, you know, I know I've used a lot of extra verses in this message that are not in my outline of the bulletin. I know that. But I'm doing what God is revealing in my heart at the moment to say. And I'm telling you, God says we need not fear. And those disciples were afraid when Jesus told them he was going to die. In John 14.1, he said... Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And and then he said, it's a peace. It it is indeed a peace that passeth all understanding. But but he said to them in John 14, 27, Peace I live with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. As long as Jesus is in us, we have no reason to fear anything. Even persecution. You know, we have talked about recently, Bond has brought to our attention recently in some of our Wednesday night studies. And you, I know we're not going to be meeting on Wednesday nights temporarily for a little bit. But when we get back together, I encourage you to come because we can, we can really talk about some things that are very encouraging and helpful to us. And we're, we're talking about, you know, hey, look, folks, face it. The way our world's going, we're, get, we're drifting from God. And, and we're going to be facing persecution. You think we're not? You're naive. We're, the church are, are, are going to be persecuted in the days and months and years to come. And, uh, but, you know, the way I look at it, as long as God's in me, hey, bring it on. we got God on our side. If God's on our side, who can be against us? We're okay. Don't worry. Jesus is the answer to all of our fears. And then I will tell you, he's the answer and the solution to sin's curse. Sin's presence will always be here. We're always tempted to sin as long as we're on this earth. And that will not end until we get to heaven. But as long as we're on this earth, we'll be tempted to sin because of sin's presence. But we are, we are not saved and delivered from sin's presence until we are glorified in our glorified body and we go to heaven. But as long as we're on this earth, we're in sin's presence. But we have been and are Delivered, set free from the prison of sin's curse that would send us to hell. This is what it says in Psalm 58, verse 3. The wicked are estranged from the womb. The wicked are estranged from the womb. That is, ever since we were born and we got to the age of accountability, then you know what? We're we're estranged from God. Everyone is. But Romans 5, 8 says, But God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners and estranged from God, that is, Christ died for us. He died for us. So he is the answer to sin's curse. Would there be anyone here and you don't know Christ, or if you're unsure of your salvation, would you make it right before it could be everlastingly too late? Because he's the way, the truth, and the life. He's the answer. He died to keep us out of hell. That's why we should follow Jesus, because of who he is. He's God the Son, he's the Word, and he's the answer. That's why we should follow Jesus. Wherever he leads, we should go. Wherever he leads, we should go, or I'll go. We should sing, I'll follow my Christ who loves me so, wherever he leads. I'll go. Is that the song we sing on our, from our heart here this morning? Is that the song, is that song the theme of our life? 
I'm going to go where Jesus leads. Let's follow Jesus because of who he is. Let us pray.